Hello, this is Sherry Greenhouse, Managing Partner of CRM Exchange, and I'd like to welcome you to our third session for today. How hard should your customer work to get their issue resolved? So with over 20 years of experience in speech recognition and interface usability, Bernhard Zoom is Director of Professional Services and Evoke Analytics at Raytheon BBN Technologies. His work focuses on designing consulting services for call centers to improve usability, workflow, and the overall caller experience. He's co-authored several patents, book chapters, and published papers on speech interface usability, multimodal interaction, speech to speech translation, and statistical language modeling. He has a PhD in computer science. So it is now my pleasure to turn this webcast over to Bernhard. Thank you, Sherry. And thank you, everybody, for joining today's webinar. I'm glad so many of you expressed interest. I realized, at least for those folks on the Eastern time, it's late in the day. So I think I have some interesting content here to grab your attention. Two webinars ago, I made the case that effort is a great metric for optimizing the delivery of customer service in the call center environment. And I said so because effort allows you to optimize both efficiency as well as strength and loyalty. Well, today, uh, at least for those who haven't hopped on this bandwagon, I'll present some additional uh, data and evidence why this is a good idea. Second, once you look at effort, you'll soon find yourself analyzing customer journeys. And well, in today's multi-channel world, uh, that's expected to be not the call, but instead the web, maybe chat, maybe, maybe mobile applications. And that's all good and well. However, as long as you succeed getting the questions answered in those channels. However, sometimes you don't succeed. And then what happens then? Well, then you tend to switch effort. Um, and those experiences tend to have the highest effort. So those are really interesting in optimizing uh, your customer service delivery. That said, so let's first start getting a pulse on where you stand with multi-channel. And we have a little poll here. So in terms of multi-channel analytics, where do you stand? Are you using multi-channel analytics, A or B? You're considering deployment of multi-channel analytics. Or C, not at this time, you don't have the budget yet. Or D, you don't have a customer service department. Or E, you don't know. So, um, well, let me tell you while you make your choices here what's on tap. Well, first we'll revisit effort, why it's a good metric to optimize customer service. Um, and well, that began in 2010, back then, uh, the corporate executive board responded some research and asked the researchers to compare different ways of uh, predicting uh, customer loyalty. And well, they had a surprising finding, namely that net promoter score, which at the time sort of was considered the silver bullet of uh, effort and predicting loyalty, that that wasn't the best predictor. Instead, effort is a better predictor of customer loyalty. Well, once you do look at effort, you'll find yourself frequently looking at customer journeys since, well, uh, if it's not straightforward to have your question answered, that's when you spend more effort. So that's not enough to really get to action, you need to understand the root causes of high effort. And we'll walk you through a case study how you can do so in the context of analyzing transfers. I already alluded to beforehand, but really uh, what you also find yourself analyzing when you look at effort is these cross-channel experiences. They are a byproduct of our multi-channel world. And um, well, what I haven't said before is what happens if you fail in the website or in chat? Well, you call. So therefore, it's a good idea to re-recognize the value of analyzing what happens in the call center 
to optimize even all the other channels besides the call. And if you need any further uh, argument why that's a good idea, consider that in, even in today's world, close to two-thirds of the total cost of service delivery is in the call center. So that's still your biggest cost driver. So it's a little early to give up on that and not invest in it. Instead, you can still wring out a lot of cost as well as better experiences by working on your call center. I'll end with some QA. Um, OK. Um, well, let's take a look maybe at the poll now, since it seems like there is already a fair number of answers, though 50% didn't answer. And then among those who answered, about a third are using another week, third or quarter are considering. All right. And, well, a good 20% of those who answered, they don't have the budget. Well, I have some good news for you. I'll show you later that you don't have to start by investing in this expensive multi-channel analytics. Instead, you can just start by pulling out the multi-channel experiences that land up in your call center. All right, well, let's revisit why optimizing customer service via effort is a good idea. Well, everybody in the customer service world knows you want to prevent customer churn because it's much cheaper to keep a customer than acquiring a new customer. Well, let's see what do customers say. Well, 81% said the company could have done something differently to prevent them from switching. And then often it's having to spend too much effort to do business with you. So here's one reason why you want to drive down effort. Reduce cost of delivery. What do customers do? Well, 75% said they will move to another communication channel when the first one didn't succeed. Well, so here you have the cross channel. And needless to say, if customers need to interact in more than one channel, that increases your total cost of getting that question answered. Finally, what does it have to do with strengthening customer loyalty? Well, 73% said they would expand their purchases by 10% or more if they received a superior customer experience. And that frequently equates with requiring one with less effort. So here you have it. By looking at effort, you can prevent customer churn, you can reduce the cost of delivery, and you can strengthen the customer loyalty. Now, how can you go about that? Well, here is an automated benchmark for customer effort. And well, I'm going to talk about the Evoke one, but you can build something very simple uh, and very similar just leveraging your own metrics that you have. So you start by looking at effort increasing events um, such as, well, customers go on the website and then they abandon the cart. Or customers go on the website and uh, poke around a lot. Or, well, callers uh, abandon in the IVR without hearing anything useful. So that's an important distinction whether or not a caller heard something useful in the IVR. Just ending the call in the IVR, which frequently in the industry is still the measurement of containment, that doesn't distinguish. There are good abandons and bad abandons. So you get measurements of all these effort-increasing events. You can leverage IVR and speech analytics to make your life easier, but you can do so with whatever tools you have available. And then you can just add those all up and average them out. And we do this uh, as a per 100 calls to have even numbers, not uh, fractions. And then you have a score, but you also have all these effort-increasing event metrics to drill further into detail. Now, why is it a good idea to do it automated instead of surveys? Well, this is objective and repeatable. And you can do it on all calls, not just the ones you selected to solicit a survey or you get feedback not just from the few who bother to answer your survey. And second, well, that's only if you have a more advanced, fancy analytics system, whole call analytics system, then those are connected to the actual experience. But even if you don't, it's really critical if to drill to root cause 
that you have this effort increasing event somehow linked to the actual experience so you can understand what was going on and what can you change to reduce effort. Here is now our effort index, but again, uh, it's just a collection of effort increasing metrics. At the top, we have the score. And remember, well, it represents effort. So high is bad, low is good. This is like uh, playing golf. And here are all the 22 metrics that we include in ours. They cover different areas in the network. Failure connecting call, those tend to be low. 10 are close. Well, that's an interesting one. And you might think, oh, well, it's good that we at least tell the customer they called during an off hour. And that's right so. But well, the fact that your customer bothered to call you indicates they had at least some expectation of getting that question answered. And if your center is closed, they have to call back. So a high number like this may raise the question, do you need to uh, expand the service hours or off make your other channels more attractive? Yeah, we have the IVR band that I talked about. Those are calls that got into the IVR and didn't hear anything. And then there's a number of others. Uh, well, here down here, we have transfer trends. 12% of agent handle calls are transferred. Well, that may be a good or bad number. But well, transfers are a bad thing. Everybody recognizes that. So you will may and ask, well, how can I reduce transfers? So let's look at that. Well, you need to drill to the root cause of transfers. And here, well, we have a trend chart, uh, transfers bobbing around. Uh, you can see some spikes there. So you may ask yourself, well, what's going on here? All right, well, now comes the critical step. How can we get to the story? Well, you can try to leverage metadata, and that sometimes helps. And I'll show you in this example how it can help here. So. Here, these colors show what the last skill was that the caller was at. And this pink here is the default skill. And you can see that's pretty even. Whereas the blue skill, that represents a third party who is only brought on the line for new service connection. So this is from the utility space. They are selling gas or electric service. And then, well, if you need that, typically you're moving or you're moving into a new apartment or a different one. Anyway, typically you need other services hooked up as well. So it kind of makes sense for utility to partner with a vendor who then attempts to upsell these customers on additional services, say cable. And that's really what's going on here. Well, the additional thing you need to remember here, well, this is in the Boston area and there's lots of students. So around when the semester begins again you have lots of people moving in and out and then probably in most cities at year end you have a bump in move in move out so that kind of explained these bumps uh, however well we may want to do more how can we reduce the space of transfers well there we need to drill deeper and actually drill into the actual experiences and i will do that here uh, with an example call that I can find in our system. And well, what I'll play to you here in a minute is what you can find in your QA system, an agent handling a caller who wants to make a payment. So let's just listen what happens. Thank you for calling. My name is Mark. Can I please have your account number? Oh, hi. I was trying to pay automatically. I don't know why I didn't get through. Uh, do you charge me for... Are you going to charge me now? A fee? No. For a check by phone? Yeah. If no. uh, With the customer service, no? Oh, okay, thank you. No. Mm -hmm. Eight, oh, okay, the number is 80. Oh. All right. Well, what happened here? Well, this uh, customer was ob uh, obviously wanted to make a payment, and she was concerned about the fee but she kind of was ready to make the payment with his agent. After all, he had started to ask for the account number. Well, and then, well, you don't really know yet what the agent is doing. She, he might have put her on hold, but he really dumped her. And next, another agent will come on the line. However, from a transfer perspective, the question is, well, why did this caller not reach the agent that could take the payment? And 
to understand that, we need to look at what happened prior. So we currently look at this segment here. Uh, and well, in your QA system, you won't find what happened in the IVR. Maybe, well, you can link it together or in a whole call analytics system, it's all there. So what happened? Well, this caller had needed several attempts to identify uh, this is the back and forth, this is the call, uh, the call center, and here's the caller. He, he attempts to enter the account number once, twice. The third time she was stumped, so she timed out, and then the fourth time she got it right. And then we'll just listen here for a brief period right here. Balance is 134. All right, so she got the balance. Well, that means the IVR identified this caller and knew what status the caller's in. And then the caller, she wants to make a payment, so she navigates down the payment path, she indicates which payment method, and then let's start listening close towards the end, what's happening there. Okay, please tell me your bank routing number. The routing number is the first nine numbers in the lower left-hand corner of your check. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Please put in the nine-digit routing number using your telephone keypad. Please hold while I transfer your call. All right, well, so what happened here? Well, she was attempting to enter this routing number, but she just took a tad too long. So this break here was too long, the system barged in, and well, if you listen carefully, actually you can hear her leave through the checkbook looking for that number, and she probably didn't even have the phone at her uh, ear, instead she was looking at the keypad, and she just keeps typing and she continues entering the whole nine digits, she doesn't even realize that the system has picked her out until she goes back on the line and finds herself in, uh, on hold for an agent. Okay, well, so well, here's an oppor lost opportunity, missed opportunity to self-serve a routine transaction, but we wanted to talk about transfers. What can we learn about transfers here? Well, so the IVR knew the account status, and it knew that the caller wanted to pay, and, uh, wanted to pay. yet it delivers the caller to an agent who cannot take the payment. So that really raises the question, do we need to revisit the IVR logic? to deliver such payment calls actually to agents that can take payment. Okay, well, but the journey hasn't ended. So this agent sent her along to a second agent. So let's round this out by hearing how this ends. Thank you for calling. This is Beth, how can I help you? Oh, hi, good afternoon, Beth. I would like to make a payment. Okay, all payments are done through two different automated systems. We have one for checks and one for credit cards. Which would you prefer I transfer you to? Oh, I was with the automatic system. I didn't, go, I didn't get through. It okay. took, yeah, I don't know why, you know. All right, well, I'd have to put you back through, and you could try it again. Um, Do you mind I, if I pay with you now? Uh, I, I don't have the capability of taking those payments any longer. We haven't been able to do that for a while now. Oh, so it has to be automatic, huh? It has to be automatic. Oh, if I don't get through, I don't know. I don't want you to, uh, you know, because I made a payment plan, you know. Oh, okay. Well, I can transfer you over to the credit department. They might be able to take the payment for you. All right. So, well, a whole boatload of bad experience here. Uh, not all relating to transfer, so... This agent was instructed, well, these agents were instructed to never take payment. And even though the caller pleads with her, please take the payment, she wants to send her back to the automated system, even though the caller indicates she has tried before. So clearly, well, here we see some business policies that are intended to encourage self-service. However, you can see how they can backfire if there's no exception for callers who attempted self-service and failed. But then at the end, we heard her, uh, the agent say, oh, you may need to go to collections, the credit department. So that 
in terms of transfers gives us some additional insight. First, latest now do we know that this agent did a really poor job, the first agent. He didn't even probe enough to find out whether or not the caller needed to go to collections or to, and he wasn't aware that the regular agents aren't able to take payment. So this one really mishandled the call. But then, if she says she needs to go to collections, that really begs the question, why did the IDR not send the call to collections in the first place? The IDR had identified the caller, so it knew. All right. So, well, here, uh, just briefly, that maps out the whole journey. It started in the IVR, and it sort of jots down here the actionable insight that really then leads to improvements you can make. Didn't give the call enough time, so we need to give the callers enough time to enter long numbers, especially some that we need to look up. And the IVR may have defaulted to the wrong skill. I suspect, because the caller errored out at the end, that there is a generic default route for all error routes to go to the default skill. What would be better is a um, context-aware default routing rule that takes into account if the caller was identified and identified as a collections account that we don't default route to the floor but default instead route to collections directly. And then we could have avoided both agent segments. Um, the first agent didn't probe enough and dumped the caller and didn't explain the reason for the uh, transfer. And the second agent mishandled her by threatening to send her back to the IVR, even though she stated the trouble she had. Um, yeah, so well, now we've seen how these root causes lead to actionable recommendations. Coach on probing, increase in the digit timeout, review the default routing rules. Review business policies that attempt to push calls into self-service, but establish some meaningful exceptions to those. All right, so here is the whole nine yards on transfers based on our 15 years of experience consulting call centers on how to reduce transfers. Uh, this may be a little overwhelming, but the two ones we looked at is here IVR misroutes, even though the IVR knows the caller and the reason for the call as payment routed to the wrong skill. And then we saw agent behavior, the lack of probing or knowledge, and then agent games, that's how we refer to agents dumping calls so they can improve their handle time metrics. And you see others here, call identification. So latest this call should illustrate how important it is to know your customer so you can route them appropriately and, proper, and potentially proactively treat them. Of course, they need to pick the right options so you can route them appropriately. Escalations, they, frequently you can't do much about those. Uh, if you have different levels of skill, uh, at some point, the lower skill just has to escalate. And the multiple call reason transfers are hard to get by, too. The most you could do is if your skill boundaries are really fuzzy, you could sort of make them crisper, but uh, that's harder work. And then there's process transfers where you need to dig deep into your processes. Okay, so much for transfers. Let's move on to a different case study here out of healthcare, and now we'll start to break out of, uh, break out of um, the call channel. So here uh, I have a journey of a patient uh, interacting with a provider. So they have their uh, a broken leg or something, they seek medical assistance, uh, they receive medical help, uh, you leave the facility, but then later they may analyze the actual x-ray and have some follow-up, or they may get some lab results, so then the provider reaches out to you. However, they don't reach you. So, oh, so then what happens? Well, this call center, well, this provider uh, or this healthcare provider attempted to offload routine increase to a centralized call center, so that's the ladies down here. Um, and well, that's well, it meant a good intention here uh, so that your providers don't get interrupted all day by increase about rescheduling appointment, appointment or canceling appointment or just retrieving some lab results the first time. So that makes sense. However, 
Well, really, in this situation where the patient needs follow-up on their treatment, these ladies, the call center, cannot provide any assistance. All they can do is attempt to reach out to the provider. If he or she is available, they can put them through, and you get your question answered. If not, it kicks off a whole new cycle. Then this provider is forced to leave another message with you. They may or may not reach you, and then you end up calling here again. So that ends up looping. So what did we learn here? Well, the intent to offload some routine inquiries, get them out of the provider offices, is laudable. Uh, however, they ended up wasting 15% of the total agent labor in this call center was wasted, just taking these inquiries and then relaying them to the provider or asking them to call back. So that wasted cost for you, it's wasted effort for the patient. Um, so, well, you might wonder what you can do, uh, but that's for another day. What do you need to understand these journeys? Well, obviously you need the visibility into these journeys from beginning to end. And we saw in the first example how not just having one agent caller dialogue, but the context, what happened in the IVR prior. They attempted to make the payment and failed to provide the routing number. And what happened afterwards? The next agent still refused to take the payment and then transferred to collection. How that information is key to really reduce transfers and reduce effort. And in the second example, though, we'll build on that some more. You can see how other channels here, the web or even your brick and mortar environment can drive calls, and then the journey begins there. All right, well, it's time to look back at our effort metrics that we started with. So we've looked at the trends for trends. Now another one here is the multi-channel mention. And what we do here is we do exactly what I said in the beginning. If customers fail in the other channels, they end up calling. So you can learn a lot pulling those calls out of your call center. You can learn a lot about the website and your chat and email efficiency. And that's what we are doing here, pulling out those calls in this environment, a whopping 20% of the call center interactions are about, well, at least other channels are mentioned. Well, again, the next question is why, or what can you do to reduce those? Well, uh, you need to analyze them some more. Uh, and speed analytics can help to find them, so you don't need to look for needles in the haystack. Uh, I'll have an alternative for you if you don't want to invest in speech analytics in a minute. But let's look at some of these experiences. And uh, so we'll look at the call where the customer also needed to make a payment, but they didn't receive uh, the bill in the mail. So let's listen what happened there. Thank you for calling. My name is Nikki. How can I help you? Um, yes, ma'am. I was having, I haven't got my last bill, and I'm having a problem getting on my site. Can you uh, look up my account and help me out, please, so I can make a payment or whatever has to be done? Sure. What's your name? John. And it's one four. The last two times I tried to log on, I'm having a problem. I don't know if it's because of a capital letter or I don't know what the problem is. All right. So, uh, first he was expecting to receive his. Well, it's a utility. Utility bills are still sent out via regular mail often uh, in the mail, and he didn't receive it. So that was the trigger. But then we already hear he attempted to figure out his balance logging on, but he has trouble uh, logging onto the website. Um, and well, we find out a little more. So let's, uh, I'm skipping some interaction. Let's listen a little bit later. I mean, I got an email saying that there was something to do by July 7th or something, but I, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so now the cross-channel journey expands. He actually received an email. Well, many companies are proactive these days. They send an email in addition to regular mail or even a phone call, and that's all good. So then at least he is aware he needs to make a payment. Um, yes, uh, but, well, he has trouble logging in. Uh, 
The question still remains, why didn't he receive the bill? We get the answer about five minutes in the, into the call, and here it is. It has it. It's paperless. So that may be why you're not getting a physical bill. It has it as paperless, on? Yes, as of March 24th. Ha. Huh. Paperless. Okay. But it sounds like the customer wasn't aware that's the case. And, well, here we see another practice backfire, uh, a well-intended practice, I may say, where companies try to push customers over to paperless because it saves them so much money. And really, it could be a win-win uh, if you are able to log into the websites and retrieve information there. Uh, but then if you just default your customers over to paperless and then they have to do something to opt out of that, that's when you get situations like this where customers aren't even aware. They are not receiving a paper bill anymore. All right. Well, uh, this call is actually a pretty long one. It's a 20-minute call. What happens is for the next three minutes, the agent takes to unlock the account because his password, well, he attempted multiple times. It was locked. And then she walks him through getting back in, uh, which takes another three-plus minutes. And then, well, the customer has some questions. And then the agent actually explains those uh, billing questions to him. So, well, uh, if nothing else, we see how easily customers navigate between different channels. But how all this can come together by just picking out the right calls and getting ideas how you can improve. Um, well, the one take that there's a couple more comments here. So one is uh, the single biggest hurdle to doing website self-service these days are login problems. And I know that's a hard one because the security people have raised such high hurdles for people, but it's just out of control. You just can't remember all these different requirements and passwords. So I just plead somebody out there, find a better way for us to authenticate. Second, uh, since the agent walked the call, attempted to walk the caller through the process, I wonder whether that's a good idea. It may be if, uh, if you, your callers are likely to use the self-service many times, so if you're working with a repeat caller. But if they're occasional callers, I might surmise this is wasted because the next time they attempt to go on the website, they have forgotten your coaching again. So, well, I have worked with a large telco who attempted to coach its customers on, on using their self-service channels in the call center. And I just, I'm not sure that's the right approach. Anyway, so to summarize the story, it started with the invoice. The caller got an email that alerted him, oh, I am behind on my payment. So he simply didn't receive the bill. Well, he goes online, has trouble logging in, and then he ends up calling to get his password reset. Well, now we have a number of ways how we can make our customers unhappy. It can be by failing to get the job done in the channel of choice, like the website here, or in the IVR in the first example, where she attempted to do that payment via EFT. Uh, it's by treating our customer poorly and certainly sending them back to a self-service channel where they just failed, like in the first call. That's poor treatment right there. Also, if you have to go to multiple areas to get an answer, this customer was waiting for the bill, uh, got the email, but it didn't have enough information, so then he tried to log in, failed to log in, and needed to have an agent walk him through. All these things lead to poor customer service and ultimately to your customers switching. That's the risk you expose yourself to. And if there's any more argument, well, I just stumbled again over an article from years ago, but it very much still applies. It explains why satisfied customers still defect. And that research uh, done at Harvard suggests, well, unless you are in the lucky situation of having a pure monopoly, sitting on a, a pseudo-monopoly or a real monopoly where the customer doesn't have any other choice, unless you're in that lucky situation, it makes a big difference whether customers are just satisfied or they are completely satisfied. 
that research showed only the completely satisfied customers will really be loyal and drive repeat business. Okay, well, just to drive the point home that I have made sort of on the sidelines before, what is the role of the call center in this multi-channel world? Well, so here a little case study, you receive a solicitation in the mail telling about this great deal on a notebook or whatever. You go off to the store and buy it. Then you go home, you try to set it up. You're having trouble setting, connecting to your internet provider or accessing your email or reading in your legacy documents since now there's new versions of all your favorite software on there. So then you might uh, consult with the website, but the website cannot deliver detailed instructions, so instead they sometimes send them by email. You might even, well, if you're very patient, you read through them, but then you're still scratching your head. You might engage with channel, with chat, but that still doesn't fully resolve your question. You have another question a day later or two. So then, what happens? Well, everything ends in the kitchen sink of multi-channel, which is the call center. And if you need any further evidence, uh, here is some numbers. 27, 71, my apologies, 71% of customers will call when the email goes unanswered. 55% will call when a social media entry goes unanswered. And Honestly, I would have expected those numbers to even be higher. Now, what can you do here? Well, this is what many are working on. Well, I guess with a poll of, well, a, a week third of you. Uh, and certainly the industry is pushing that very much. Well, we all know there's all these different channels and customers are trying to do business with you in all these channels. So therefore, to analyze what's going on, well, you have to build this multi-channel data warehouse so you have visibility into everything. Yes? Well, certainly it's very expensive to do so. And drilling to root cause may still not be very easy. So here I'll give you an alternative. Why not just analyze the evidence in each channel individually that you may already have at your fingertips or could get to with much less expense than this multi-channel data warehouse. And, well, above all, rediscover your call center as a gold mine where you can learn about the failures in your other channels and optimize them. That's a lot cheaper than investing in this expensive infrastructure, and it gets you actually working on improving a lot sooner. You don't work on establishing this data warehouse. You can immediately work on identifying root cause and laying out some actions. Well, do you need technology? You can make do without it. You look at the logs from your IVR to find areas where customers opt out or transfer out. You can find similar spots on the website. And well, if you don't want to add speed analytics to a sample of your call recordings, you can instruct your QA people to pull out multi-channel mentions and then analyze those calls in more detail. So those are two very simple, inexpensive things to get you started. And that's all what I'm talking about here. Just get started on actually improving. Don't invest all the time and budget in getting the fancy infrastructure. So what does it leave you with to manage your custom experience? Well, I repeated the case. Effort is a great metric to optimize the overall customer service delivery. Once you have that metric and its breakdown, you can identify the root cause by drilling into the actual experiences and understanding what caused the effort. And now, well, many companies I've worked with, they stop here. But it's really important you actually act on what you find. I recognize that's a difficult step because there's all these competing uh, opinions and stakeholders that may raise hurdles why you shouldn't act or why you should do something differently. So, well, see what the data told you and then navigate a path around all the other obstacles to, to address the issues that the data revealed. And then you close out the cycle by validating uh, that your, your changes actually had the desired effect. Pretty basic. And I'll end here today with just 
uh, praising uh, the benefits of having a whole call analytics system. As we've seen in a case study, it reveals the drivers of effort and improvement opportunities once you drill to root cause, and that's a lot easier having it all in one uh, experience. By hearing how customers struggle, it gives you a customer-centric view as opposed to a data warehouse where the customer is far removed and you just see those numbers and uh, you have to work hard to reconstruct what was the actual customer experience. You've seen how, well, you can look at customer feedback, they get upset and have the actual interaction that led to that feeling in the same place and that makes voice of the customer so much more effective. And then I'll end on what I pitched in the very beginning Instead of investing in this expensive multi-channel infrastructure, find the single biggest multi-channel issue in your call center, work on that, and then return to working on your infrastructure. And with that, I'll hand back to Sherry and for some questions. Thank you very much, Bernhard. Um, as a reminder, to ask questions, go to the Q&A tab. It's, if you have not opened it, it would be all the way at the bottom. Click on that little triangle and, and you can place your questions in there. Uh, okay, we have our first question and um, they're asking about integration. Uh, how is your t the tool integrated into other platforms like Avaya, Cisco, Genesis, any of those platforms? Well, our tool doesn't need any integration because we insert ourselves at the network level. So that's very simple. Zero integration. We insert ourselves at the network level. Okay, good. Uh, here's our next question. With all the various channels customers now have to communicate, what types of interactions are occurring on the phone and what type of data can you derive from those conversations that you may not be able to get from other channels? Well, um, so you see the whole range of interactions on the phone. On other channels, you see a subset because there you can only deal with and succeed in the simpler interactions. So it's a broader range of interactions that you see on the phone. And then in addition, even with the other channel interactions that had trouble, it may be pretty hard to interpret what was going on by just looking at failure points in the website in isolation or failure points in the IVR in isolation. If, however, you can go to a call where the customer said, oh, I've tried to do this on the website or I've, like in the call we looked at, I tried to enter this bank routing number, just didn't give me enough time, well then, you immediately can recognize what you need to change to uh, reduce effort and make customers more successful. So I argue there's actually more analytic information in those end-to-end -end calls than in some of the isolated channel data you may get. Okay, thank you. And let me see. Um, okay, here's another question. It seems that self-service is leaving IVR and going to other channels. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I agree that's a, 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 a trend, definitely, but it's a slow trend. So clearly, all this web self-service has taken out some calls out of the call center environment. And, well, it takes out the routine calls, mostly. So then what's left are the hard interactions they, that really need agent assistance, that need hand-holding. So uh, it's certainly a trend, but I think it's a slow trend. Uh, in the 10, 15 years ago, people predicted with the uh, voice web that the call center would be uh, oblivious in, within 10 years. Now, 15 years later, it still represents 70% of the cost. So I think it's too early to give up on the call center. Uh, yeah, that the person has a follow-up. Should they continue to spend money on the IVR, or should they also look elsewhere? Well, to kind of expand on my last sentence, so you can see the usage, though 
in absolute terms, well, relative to the total customer base, uh, and look at how much self-service does your IVR deliver versus how much self-service does your website deliver. And then once in that equation, your IVR is a small minority compared to all the other channels, then would be the time to stop investing in the IVR. Okay, very good. Um, and we're coming up to um, the 50 minutes of this session. So what I'd like you to do, Bernhard, is just kind of recap the most important information you'd like everyone to remember. All right. Well, there's two main points. One is, if you haven't already, jump on the bandwagon to recognize the importance of effort in optimizing customer service delivery, since it allows you to drive down costs while strengthening customer loyalty at the same time. And then second, uh, in terms of multi-channel, and those experiences tend to be the moments of truth, as some say, uh, you can do the first crack at improving your multi-channel performance just by looking at failed multi-channel interactions that ended up in your call center. Look at those first take some action to improve on your other channels based on what you learned from your calls, and then start uh, considering investing into an expensive multi-channel analytic solution. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this session to the virtual conference. And the, um, I've chatted a couple of times at the um, PDF, and the recording can be found on the virtual conference platform. That's ecrmevents.com. And if you log in, click on the Agenda tab right near the sessions, that's where you'll be able to get all that information. Uh, but the recording won't be available for about 24 hours or so. So that concludes our, our sessions for today. Tomorrow we start with, at 12 o'clock Eastern with Be a Customer Bill of Rights Champion. And I want to rem remind everyone to please go to the booth uh, if you'd like more information on Evoke Analytics. They do have a booth. There's all sorts of information that you can download as well as there is a lounge. I don't know if you've taken advantage of the lounge, but you can all speak with each other there. And it's kind of fun to go in. So at this point, we will be closing this session, and we hope to see you tomorrow at 12. Thank you all for attending. Bye-bye.